Hey everybody, this is So Heidi, and you're listening to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. We all know that the fashion industry is brutally competitive and it takes loads of hard work to get ahead. The problem is that everyone's secretive and tight lipped about their ways. After working as a designer and educator for over a decade, I wanted to help break down those barriers and bring you valuable knowledge from industry experts, and this show is exactly where you'll find that. Whether you're trying to break into the fashion world, make yourself more marketable, launch your own label, or become a successful freelancer, we'll help you get ahead in the cutthroat fashion industry. This is episode 30 of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast, and today I'm chatting with Rosie Davies. Rosie figured out how to get press coverage with no budget, no contacts, and no previous training, and she now teaches designers how to do the same. After realizing it was ridiculously expensive to work with PR agencies, she founded her company, PR Dispatch, which gives indie brands everything they need to maximize their chances of getting press coverage. In this interview, Rosie walks us through the exact steps designers need to do to reach out to magazines, blogs, or influencers and get featured, including who you should pitch to, what your email should say, and what types of publications you should even be reaching out to. She also shares with us the number one mistake most designers make when they start trying to get press. That's the biggest mistake I see is people really investing money in PR marketing, but not having the imagery there first. Before we jump on to the interview, I have a quick favor to ask. If you enjoyed this podcast and this episode, I would be thrilled if you would help spread the word and share the show with three people you know who work in fashion, who are interested in working in fashion. It can be anybody, your coworkers, your boss, your friends, your professors, your colleagues. Take a minute right now, 30 seconds, and send a quick email or a text to three people you know in the industry and share the podcast with them. I would be so grateful. I'll give you a second to do that right now. Okay, done? Thank you so much. I really appreciate your support and your help, and it helps get the show out to tons more people in the industry. To access the show notes for today's episode, visit sfdnetwork.com slash 30. And a quick heads up on this episode, we had a little tech glitch and my side of the audio did not get recorded well. So I had to re-record all of my questions and my conversation with Rosie. If something sounds a little off, that's why. Uh, Just a heads up on that because it might sound a little bit odd in some spots. All right, ready? Now on to the interview with Rosie. Welcome, Rosie, to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. Can you please start out by introducing yourself and letting everybody know what you do in the fashion industry? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name's Rosie. Um, I do PR for independent brands. Um, I have two businesses. The first is the London Fashion Agency. Um, I started that to make PR affordable for independent brands. And so we cut away all the traditional costs from an agency. Um and then I realized that brands couldn't afford kind of our retainers, but wanted to try something themselves. So I started our second business, which is PR Dispatch, um, which is quite new, um, which allows brands to do their own PR under our guidance for £39 a month. Awesome. I love the DIY approach and giving brands the opportunity to do their own press because, as you mentioned, it can be really expensive but also a great benefit. So giving them the option to figure it out on their own is really fantastic. So I'd love to kind of start going through like a step-by-step process. So if I was a brand and I was launching a collection or I had just come out with a new collection and I wanted to get some press coverage, can you tell us exactly where I should start to go about doing that? Okay, um, so kind of before you even think about approaching magazines, I'd say go back and take a good look at your branding, your imagery, um, even your product and think, is this professional enough to get featured in a publication? Um, You know, for magazine space, the competition space is is huge. Um, So your brand really does have to be amazing, especially when you're small and starting out. So take a good look at your imagery. Show people. Don't be afraid to show people. Get their opinion. Um, And then kind of once you're really confident with that and your brand kind of about page and run story and all of that, then I would look at your assets. So for assets, you need um, cut-out imagery. So the images, product images on a white background um, because this is kind of what the magazines feature. Um, And you might want a lookbook or a press release. Some people quite like 
Um, and then the next stage is determining what publications are right for your brand. So um, think about your audience. Think about kind of what they're reading or what they're into. It might be that they don't even read magazines. It might be that they're more interested in kind of influencers or bloggers. Um, so don't waste your time with publications that aren't right for your brand or audience. Lots of people say to me, I want to be in Vogue. And I say, well, why do you want to be in Vogue? And they say, oh, because Vogue's the best. But realistically, your, your price point isn't right for Vogue or your product's not right for Vogue or your brand's not right for Vogue. So they're not going to feature you and it's a waste of time kind of you chasing them. So be realistic on the type of publications that your brand should be in. Um, and it's okay to think smaller, like lots of brands start out on kind of smaller online magazines um, or maybe independent print magazines um, before they go for the bigger ones. Um, and then once you've kind of done all that, you need to figure out who you need to contact. So definitely our biggest piece of advice, especially for the brands who do their own PR, is read the publication. Um, because a magazine are never going to feature you if you don't actually know what kind of regular features they write or what they write about. Um, so read the publication and then start emailing the editors. Um, keep emails short, sweet, attach something visual. Um, and that's kind of the best way to go about it for, in, to start with. Great. So that was a really good 10,000 foot overview. And I'd love to get a little more granular if we can. To start, you know, you said you got to make sure your brand is professional and you've got great photography and you've got assets to use that are on white backgrounds. Is this something you see most brands investing in a photographer and a full professional photo shoot to get to that stage? Oh, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think we say we say spend more money on your imagery and kind of your brand assets if you like before you spend money on PR. Don't waste your money on PR or try and don't waste your time on trying to do it yourself if you haven't got that amazing imagery. If you haven't had a professional photographer or a professional model, um, um, if you haven't really thought in depth about what what your imagery is going to look like. Um, so how's the model going to be shot? What setting is she in? How is your customer going to relate to this? And how are the press going to relate to this? Um, so 100% we say really, really invest in your imagery. I do recommend a stylist as well. I think stylists are underrated. <laughs> and it's a really hard thing to do styling. So I definitely recommend um, your clothing, clothing stylist or kind of a set stylist art direction for your shoot. No, that's such a great tip. I've done a fair amount of photo shoots myself, and it is a really hard role, and it's definitely something underrated. It's yeah. like, is the sleeve going the right way? Do things look natural? It's a really fine line to get those really natural tweaks. Okay, so we definitely want to start with really, really yeah. solid professional base of imagery and branding and the look for our product. And then from there, you said we need to make sure we're choosing yeah. the right publications to pitch to. It doesn't necessarily have to be Vogue or these huge magazines. So that can be – there's so many magazines beyond that. But beyond that, like you said, there's all these amazing blogs, which can even be more relevant nowadays. So where do you suggest people start looking for the best places to – start finding those places without getting lost in the weeds and feeling like, oh my God, I'm having to dig through hundreds and hundreds of places to find some publications. Yeah, I think where are your where are your competitors getting featured? I think that's probably quite a good place to start. Um, so maybe have a look at their coverage and have a look at where their product is. Um, after that, I'd say buy a few publications um, and see what kind of price point they feature. Um, I mean, the, the, the reason I started PR Dispatch was to help people with this exact problem. People don't, don't even know what publications are out there, so we've made it quite easy for them to kind of, to kind of get a list of publications so they can even just, just kind of go through and fix, filter out what's not, not right for them. Um, so definitely look at your competitors and um, once you've kind of looked at that, then look, start reading the publications and figuring out kind of price points. And be realistic. Like if you are retelling something or, I don't know, 
30 30 dollars 30 euros 30 pounds then just it's going to be in the lower price point magazines um so just be re- just be really realistic with that i mean bloggers are a completely different game altogether trying to find what influencers are right for you is it's slightly more difficult um and it is time it all takes time i, I do recommend someone who kind of has a good knowledge of um publications maybe an assistant or an intern um getting someone on board like that is really really valuable and so do you guys focus mostly on print publications online media such as blogs or reaching out to influencers um for so for pr dispatch um all the kind of contacts that we give people are for print and online magazines so you can't just do print anymore because print unfortunately is dwindling um so it's print and online magazines um but we do for our london fashion agency clients we do do influencers as well but it's 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 a constantly changing game influencers i mean one week it's you can give them something for free and they'll post and the next week there's a charge so it's 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 uh, no one actually knows kind of the guidelines um on working with influencers um so if people are thinking about doing it, don't feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing because, to be honest, no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> and is that <laughs> just because the influencer may just gain a bunch of popularity within a week or a couple of weeks or something goes viral and they all of a sudden feel like they have the ability to demand something more than just free product? I mean, yeah. I mean, and I think it also depends on probably monthly income, how many brands they work with that month. Can they do, do they have the time to do something for free? Um, but I think if they're going to take the product, they've really got to love it. Um, we kind of have really nailed down influencers that we love to work with. Um, but as a new brand coming in, it, it is hit and miss. Um, if you're giving something to them, you've got no contract with them, so they legally don't have to do anything. Um, so they could take your product and never post and really you haven't got a leg to stand on. Um so I think they've really got to be, for influencers, my my advice would be is get them engaged in your brand. So really get to know them, see the other brands that they feature. Are they featuring High Street, one week High Street, and the next week Luxury? And if they are, they're probably not right for you. Um, they, they really need to niche themselves into a market. Um, and you'll, you'll, know if, you'll know if they like small businesses. You'll see them featuring the odd small business. So um yeah definitely get to know them and make sure they know who you are before you contact them because you've got more of a chance of them saying yes to accepting a product okay and so getting them to know who you are would that just be maybe like engaging on their instagram and commenting yeah. on their blog posts and things like that 100 percent. so really engaging on their i'd say engaging on their instagram is probably best and like a lot of them are getting out now they're now speaking at events or attending things i mean go along if you can just meet them in person if you can build that sort of relationship with them, I think it's really, really valuable. And my other point would be don't just go for the typical fashion blogger. Um, I think this is where a lot of people go wrong. Um, they really gravitate towards kind of a traditional fashion blogger, whereas actually an influencer could be anyone. It could be your next door neighbor. Um, and they just might have 5,000 Instagram followers. Um, I saw one of our clients yesterday and they said um, we gave – their product to lots of different influencers and they said the one that worked the best was the one with the least followers um she only had five thousand followers but all of her followers were really really engaged um so really if really niche yourself and find ones that are right for you and don't worry too much about the numbers that's a great point. I know sometimes I notice that people on Instagram may have 30,000 followers, but they're not getting many likes or comments. And so there's a relationship yeah. between the engagement and the followers. And so someone with 5,000 exactly. followers may have a lot more engagement. And so that's going to be way more valuable. So fantastic tip. Exactly. All right, so we're engaging with influencers and we're letting them know who we are and just being nice and friendly and talking to them about what they're doing on Instagram or on their blog. And then within the print and online magazine space, we're reading those publications and making sure they're a right fit for our market. They're covering things within the same price point as us. And so now do we get to the point where we're ready to send out the pitch and we're ready to send out the ask. And what does that process look like? Yeah, so 
kind of once you pin down your publications, maybe on pure dispatch we give three a month because we think that's kind of manageable for a small business, but maybe try and get five and say, okay, these are the five places I can realistically see my products. Um, Obviously read them, figure out what's a regular feature. So a regular feature for us is something that features in every single issue of the magazine. So it might be like the lust list or what we love or weekly weekly list, something like that. They're really good. They're really good space because they're looking for product all the time um, and it's slightly easier to get in them. So I'd say that's probably a really good starting point. Um, also, if you've got a fashion product, then you should be looking at kind of maybe their editorial um, and kind of their fashion features which will change it might be summer wardrobe or autumn wardrobe or I don't know red clothes or kind of that sort of stuff so kind of compile a list of editors that uh, you've seen write those features you need to find their um, contact details which you can do by trawling the internet or sometimes if you open the front of the magazine they might be listed there Um, don't be afraid to call up the magazine and ask for their email address they'll probably give it to you um, mm, and okay, that's great. And we're looking for the editor specifically? We're looking for the person that compiles that feature. So we call them editors, so it might be, you know what, a fashion assistant might compile that feature. At the, on the side of every single feature, there should be, in most publications and online, there should be the person's name who put that together. And that's the person you really want to target. And sometimes we say the people kind of at the bottom of the food chain, if you like, so really, really like the interns, the assistants, um, actually are the people that are finding the brands. So it's good to get in with them. I think they're, re- they're, they're underrated. Um, so definitely be on their radar. Um, and then kind of put together a really short email um, saying, so the type of email we type is like, hi, so-and-so, hope you're well. Um, I loved the style list that you put together last week. Um especially that pair of shoes. Um, uh, we're a new brand. We've just launched. Uh, this is what we do. Link to the website. I'd love to send you some images for your stylist. Attached is our lookbook or attached are a few images. Um, and that's like kind of the best way to get in. For these, for these kind of pages with product on that everyone wants to be on or gal- online galleries with product, they actually don't want to know your whole business story. Um, they're really interested in what color the product is, how good your imagery is, and what the price is. Um, that's really all they want to know because they want to know that your product fits with their reader, and their reader is going to relate to it. It's not too cheap, it's not too expensive, your branding's good, your imagery's good. Um, they don't want to know the whole backstory or how you founded the company. So really, you don't need to attach press release, just keep it really, really short and sweet. Um, so that's kind of how you go about product placement in magazines and online galleries. Um, people kind of want more of a story if they have got a story to tell about their brand. And my honest response to that is it takes a long time to get that sort of press. Um, they want to see that you've got a bit of a following first. They want to see that you're loved on Instagram. They want to see that you're loved by the press and kind of the, and kind of the shopping galleries. They want to see some kind of credibility before they're going to, write a whole story on the backstory of your brand. Um, so I, I, that's when kind of uh, starting at the smaller publications might be slightly better because you might get more of, it, more of a story about your brand on smaller publications. And when you say smaller publications, what are some readership numbers we might be looking for? Um, I mean, any anything from kind of a few thousand is great. I mean, as long as I think I wouldn't worry too much about readership. I'd be more interested on the type of publication that it is. So say, I don't know, say you're an ethical brand and there's a website that's dedicated to ethical and sustainable fashion and every single brand they feature is absolutely gorgeous and it it would be credible for you to sit alongside them. I think that's the kind of thing that you need to look out for. I mean, magazines and especially online magazines are emerging all the time. Um, there's a new one every single week and I just think it's like giving some of them a chance and seeing what else they feature you'll know if they've niched themselves and it's it's credible for you to sit on that publication and it's okay to say no if someone approaches you and 
you're like, oh, that's not quite in line with our brand. It's okay to say no. Okay, um, because you'd rather have your product in the right press that's aligned with your brand than to sacrifice just for press coverage. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing that is we're asked a lot is about advertorial, um, which is advertising and editorial combined together. Um, it's about, I don't know, it's about £400 um, pound in the UK and um I am so against it. I think it, it really, really devalues brands. Um so they pay to sit on a page at the back of the magazine. And I I just think really don't don't do it. Spend that money on improving your brand and improving your imagery. Um because no one reads those pages and it just doesn't translate. So just to know an advertorial I'd avoid it. That's such a great tip. Uh, the real natural press coverage is a lot more priceless than the stuff that you pay for. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so the pitch, keep it really short, keep it really simple. No offense to you, but they don't really care about how you founded your brand or why, to be totally blunt to it, <laughs> uh, which is hard to hear. Yeah. <laughs> but like you said, the three most in things are color-wise, does it work into the palette that they're trying to present? price point and then is the photography great quality are those the three things that they really care about i'd say price point um how good your brand is and um price point how good your brand is and is your photography good um the other thing is is it relevant to what they're working on which comes into that into that umbrella of the color palette or the page that they're putting together um is it is it relevant like it's, it's pointless pitching knitwear in May. Um, so <laughs> just kind of thinking about what they're actually compiling and being aware of the lead time. So if you if you want to contact kind of Vogue or Elle or uh, Red, then it, they're working five months ahead. So now we're thinking about spring, summer for them. We're in October now. So we're starting to think about spring, summer. They're working on February issues and, you know, they work ahead anyway. Um, short lead, which are weekly magazines, um, they work anything between kind of five weeks to three months ahead. Um, so, so we're really focused on Christmas for them now. And then online, um, it's pretty instant. So we're kind of doing Halloween, um, and like knitwear, winter stories. Um, so yeah, just be aware of their lead times as well. They're not going to want to run a product or feature a product if it's not in season. That's such a great tip. Um, the other thing that you mentioned in the pitch was saying something like, I love that feature you did last week. I love that pair of shoes you featured. Yeah. Letting them know that you're really paying attention to what they're doing that rather than just sending a copy yeah. and paste email, being really specific. Yeah. They're much them. more likely to get back to you if you've actually taken the time to read their, read their features and you know the publication inside out there. It's it's just like they're fed up. They get well. One editor told me she gets a thousand emails a day. Um, I know, I know, <laughs> and I could probably tell you that probably eighty percent of them have not thought about that email, and it's just kind of just not. It's not personalised, and they haven't really read the feature. So I think it means a lot when they get an email saying, "I really liked what you did last week." It's, it's just nice. So um, yeah. I, we do we do find that it works sometimes if we commented on something that they've done previously. No, that's a great tip, though, because like you said, probably 80% of the emails are not going to be specific. And so if 80% of those are really generic, it's not worth it to send out a bunch of generic emails. You have a much better chance of getting coverage if you focus on just five and yeah. send them really customized, tailored emails. Your chance of getting featured is going to go up tenfold. Absolutely. Absolutely. The more time kind of you put into that publication, the more likely you are to be featured. And that's why we get so few contacts each month. So brands can really make their pictures really, really good and their assets really good and they have much more of a chance of kind of gaining that gaining that coverage space over someone who hasn't kind of made any effort at all. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so great, great tip. All right, so you said about maybe five per month is a good amount to reach out to. So I could send like, let's say one a week, or I could batch it and do it all in one day. Yeah. Uh, but after I send out those five emails, what do I do? Do I follow up? Do I just move on to the next publication? You know, how exactly should I handle if I don't hear back or anything? Yeah. So I think. Um, so I think send the emails. Don't don't send them on a Monday. Don't send them on a Friday. Um, I just think they their heads aren't in the game on those days. Um, so I'd avoid those days, especially not Monday morning, because lots of them have Monday morning meetings. Um, so I'd avoid those days. Um, and don't be disheartened if they don't email back, to be honest. They're only really going to email back if, unless, unless you sent an amazing email and they just want to say, thanks, I'll keep this in mind, or if they want something. Um, so lots of them might, if they say you've emailed them about knitwear, but you're a little bit early, they're not quite working on knitwear for another few weeks, which you wouldn't have known. Um, they might they might drag you into a folder um, or your book book into a folder and save it for when you do do knitwear. And then they might get back in touch with you. I mean, we've had people get back in touch six months after we initially sent them an email saying, can you send us this image? Um, so they've really got to want it to kind of respond. I think so. Kind of send all the emails. Um, you can send. Don't email any more than one person from the same magazine on the same day because they all sit really closely. Um, so don't email kind of two people from the same magazine. But I think a few weeks later, it's fine to email someone else from the team if they run a kind of a different feature. Um, it's fine to email them about their feature a few weeks later. And then I'd say send a follow up email maybe a week later. Um, you could say something like, just wanted to make sure that you got this um, or just wanted to pop this back to the top of your inbo- inbox. Let me know if there's anything I can send you. Um, don't be too pushy there. They don't owe us as a public PR agency or brands anything. Um, so I think it really pays to kind of be humble and um, be nice and not talk about why they should feature your brand. That's not kind of the way it works. They they will decide whether they want to. Um, so that would be my advice on that one. Don't be too pushy, but just, just stay them in the loop. And then I always recommend Instagram. Um, I think this is why PR can now be done by brands and it can be done affordably. It's because social media has completely kind of changed the way well the world works. Um, so traditionally, you wouldn't be able to find an editor because You wouldn't be able to find them on social media. You wouldn't know what they looked like. You wouldn't know what they were into. And now you can find the fashion editor of Vogue so easily if they're on social media. Um, So I recommend from your brand account, not from your personal, but from your brand account, following them, interacting with them, liking them, just making sure that you're on their radar, basically. Um, So when they do need that knitwear or they do need that pair of socks, they know your brand because they've seen you interacting with them on Instagram. Um, we get a lot of people come to us and say, oh, I found, I saw this brand on Instagram. Um, when actually it's been us that's been interacting with them. Um, so I think Instagram's a really, really powerful tool, which is why social media and visually how it looks is so, so important for like getting PR results. And I would add to that, uh, when you are interacting with them on Instagram to make your comments thoughtful oh, yeah. and relevant, yeah. not just like awesome photo, uh, just put 30 seconds into the thought process behind your comment and say something that's going to stand out like a real genuine comment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like if you kind of, if you can relate to them in any way, shape or form, maybe you're going to like a similar event, maybe you're reading the same book. Um, kind of anything like that, I think it's great to get involved in um, a conversation. If they post kind of an editorial that they did in the magazine, you could say, picked up a copy today, thought this was absolutely great, love X brand that you featured. Um, I think it's really important to be genuine. Awesome. Okay, now going back to the email pitch, is it sort of short and to the point, like product feature in ABC magazine or what do you guys see getting the best results for subject lines? We've tried everything. <laughs> uh, we've tried. Yeah, we've tried everything. We've tried um, some really, really funny ones, which make me laugh. And I am convinced they 
make the press laugh. I mean, we, they really tickle me because when the girls, uh, Celia and Shannon, who work at the London Fashion Agency, when kind of they send the emails to the press, I can see them. So sometimes they really do make me chuckle. Um, so any sort of humour I think is great. I think maybe something like, um, okay, so you make really bright, colourful socks. You could say um, bright, colourful socks for the stylist. So straight away, if she or he are looking for a product for that feature, you've already kind of mentioned the feature in the sub- subject line and you've mentioned the product. Um, I think that's quite effective. Um, I think kind of saying something that they might want to hear. Um, I don't know. So yellow, okay, for example, yellow is on trend next summer. So you could say yellow shoes uh, for spring, summer, and they might be working on a yellow story. Um, so kind of not making it too cryptic. I think making it too cryptic can sometimes put them off. Um, and I'd always try and mention the feature if possible. Okay, so in the subject line, yeah. so saying yellow socks for the lustless, something like that? Yeah, 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 that would be, that would be right. Or kind of, if it's just generic fashion pages, you could put, um, you know, you know, pink jacket for fashion pages. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that, that would be my advice for that. Okay, fantastic. And so from here, let's say that one or two do pick us up. Do they let us know when it's going to run or keep us in the loop? Or do we just kind of keep hitting refresh in our browser? What does that look like? (laughs) Definitely the latter. Okay, I had a feeling that's what that was like. (laughs) Uh, You got it spot on there. Um, So the first thing, so say they respond to you and they say, hey, can you, this is great. Can you send me an image? That's probably what they'll say. Um, uh, okay, so you send them over a high-res image. Make sure your image is a high-res, so 300 DPI um, and crystal clear. And So you send them over an image, and then they probably won't get back to you. And you'll email them and email them and email them, and they won't get back to you. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's slightly more confirmed um, if they ask for something uh, called a credit, um, so a credit, sometimes, it, well, I remember when I first got asked, cause I never did PR before this, but when I got asked for our first credit, I was like, what is a credit? Um, but a credit is <laughs> the brand name, um, the price point and where it's available to buy from. So it could just be your website, um, which if you want the traffic, I'd definitely just put your website. Um, so if they ask for a credit, it's slightly more confirmed than if they've just asked for an image because the credit will obviously be printed in the magazine. So that means it's kind of missed the, the being cut phase, if you like, and it's got slightly more of a chance, but it still could be cut by kind of the graphic design team or say an extra page of advertising comes in, it could be cut then. Um, so it's, it's I, I think when you send the image over, what we normally do is, um, thanks so much for calling this in, attach to the image, uh, have you any idea what issue this is for? Or have you any idea when this is coming out? Because then at least you've got a bit of a kind of gauge of when it might be out. Um, and then we always say kind of keep an eye on the previous issue and the next issue after because um, it could get pushed. So, yeah, I think that's probably my advice on that one. Okay. And so that's where you're just like hitting refresh or watching for it to hit. And so let's say maybe three months pass and you don't see it. Do you think at that point you just lost the opportunity? And should you follow up and ask if it's going to be in a future publication or? Yeah. If, I mean, if, if they've called in uh, your image or your product, if they've called in a product to shoot, um, you've got, you, you know you're right for that publication. That's like the first massive hurdle. So if you've got the all-important call in, you know you're doing something right. Um, so then it's definitely kind of good to stay on the editor's radar. Make sure you, every time you have any collection, you're sending them a lookbook or you send them some imagery. And you can say something like, just wanted to show you what we've got for the season. If you want me to send anything over, let me know. Um, don't expect that they'll come back to you because they won't. They'll forget. So you kind of have to really kind of stay on their radar. And then if you do get featured, I always say it's really important that you like say thank you. Um, make sure kind of you tag them on like, Instagram. Um, just show them some love because they might need lead to your next calling. 
Okay, now a couple of questions. You referenced something earlier. I think you said like a call in. Um, how often do they actually ask for us to send the physical product versus just sending imagery? Um, imagery is probably about, I'd say imagery is about 75%, and products, kind of the rest. Products, kind of, because uh, magazines don't have the budget anymore to shoot. Um, so, kind of, you might have noticed in print, like, the number of shoots has really kind of gone down. Um, if you send the product, um, you will get it back. Just make sure you're on their make sure you're on their case about sending it back to you. So be really organised. Send it with kind of a return address. Um, we include something called a lending sheet, which kind of says what they've had, uh, where they need to send it back to, all that sort of stuff. Um, and kind of just yeah, stay on their case because they they should be sending anything they lend back to you. I think I think that people should want shopping pages and kind of the the imagery featured in the magazine more than the product because the product just gets lost in the shoe and people don't actually shop from it. Um, so I'd, I'd really focus on the shopping over the, we call it editorial. Um, yeah, I'd really focus on that. Okay. And then in respect to following up, is it appropriate to, let's say I got featured in another publication that's complementary to theirs would it be appropriate for me to send press coverage from a different publication to them and say, hey, look, I got featured over here. Uh, you guys yeah. should maybe look at featuring me. Is that appropriate? I wouldn't put an email. I think it's good to put it on your website and it's good to put it on your social media with the hope that they might stumble across it. Um, I wouldn't put an email, but it's definitely once you get one, the ball does really start to roll. Um, so I, yeah, definitely get it as featured by on your website. Um, I think it's really good to have a blog post about it because it increases kind of your search engine optimization and, um, definitely put it on your social media. If the press stumble across it, then great. And magazines read, editors read other magazines. So you are, they are looking out for kind of the next, next hot thing. So yeah, I don't think you need to say it, but it's definitely good to promote it. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and at what point, if I've not heard back, should I look at evaluating what might be wrong? Is it 10 pitches or is it 50 pitches? And I've really spent the time to make sure I'm writing the right emails. It's the right publications. I hope, I think my imagery is good. At what point should I say something is probably wrong and I need to figure out how to solve it? I think about four months in. Um, I think you've got to give them that time to get to know the brand. You've really got to be interacting them on social media. You've got to let some time pass to see if it's the right or wrong time of year. Um, and I think at four months, if you haven't had one response by the end of the fourth month, then you need to go back and look at your brand. And it might be that your branding, your imagery isn't bad. It might be your product, um, which is a horrible thing to say. But um, the press don't feature, like, boring product from independent brands. Um, so, and by boring product, I don't mean the product that no one buys because everyone buys it, but, like, black handbags, beige handbags, black socks, black underwear. Like, they just don't feature it. And if they're going to feature it, they're going to feature it from a bigger brand that's advertising in the magazine. So that's something to really kind of be aware of is it might be that we call it like a press piece. You might need an item in your collection that really is a press piece. So like um, bold print, a bold color, a bold shape, something that really is going to stand out in magazines. And if you don't have those press pieces, you really might struggle with kind of getting that coverage that you need. Um but yeah, four months. At four months, I take a relook. Okay, and if that press piece doesn't really fit into my brand or my product or my assortment, do I introduce something just for that? Do is that something people do, or is 
there something else I should do? Should I maybe look at getting featured with a small niche influencer? What are my options at that point? Because it's hard to introduce something that doesn't go along with my brand just to get the press coverage. Yeah. No? I've I've, I've seen brands that kind of, they have really kind of beautiful product, but it is all kind of black, white, brown colors. And they said to me, well, we don't, we don't want to introduce kind of a bright color. It's not our thing. And I said, I totally get that. So I think in that case, I'd go down the smaller, more independent online and print publications. And I'd also work with influencers because it was a really beautifully designed product, but it's just, like not standout colors influencers might be the way you know they all love kind of minimalist minimalist clothing there's so many influencers that do this so i I definitely kind of go down that route if if you're struggling with kind of the bolder pieces all right that's a great tip because i feel like it can be hard to force something into your collection if it's just not part of your brand yeah definitely um okay now two really cliche questions but what is Number one, what is the biggest mistake you see brands making when trying to get press coverage? Not spending money on their imagery. Ah, okay. So it's not <laughs> even that, the press. It's more like the step before it. It's the step before it. Every time. Every time without fail. Not spending money on on imagery. I, I talk quite a lot of events on PR, and I, I'd say... 80% of my talk is about imagery and 20% is about the actual kind of contacting publications. It's all in, you can sell anything, not just the press, but to influencers, to consumers, to anyone. You can sell anything if your imagery is good enough. Um, so I think imagery, 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 and not just kind of one set of imagery. Think about kind of the imagery that you're going to feature on social. Um, so kind of having product imagery, lifestyle imagery, model imagery, if it's clothing or accessories. Um, to really having a real strong assortment of imagery that you can run for a whole season so it's not going to get boring. Um, so that's the biggest mistake I see is people really investing money in PR marketing but not having the imagery there first. So then it's almost a waste to do all that work when you don't have the right tools in your toolbox to send it's, the press. Yeah, such a waste. It's such a waste of money. As, as an agency... So with the London Fashion Agency, we won't take on anyone that if we don't feel your imagery is strong enough because it's just such a, you don't, they don't see the return, they get angry, they're disappointed in the PR agency when actually they didn't have the assets there in the first place. So we, we, we're always really honest and we do we do kind of an hourly consultation where brands come in and we sit down. It's normally all about their imagery um, and the assets that they have. Um, and that's kind of what they need to go and improve before thinking about PR. So. Yeah, I think it's a waste of money unless you've got those really strong assets from the beginning. All right, really, really great tip. So start with a strong foundation, invest some money in the imagery, and it will really go a long way. Yeah. Okay, and then any fun or interesting or unconventional things you've seen brands do? Anything sort of out of the box to get press coverage? Ooh, what a good question. Um, anything I've seen brands do? Um, definitely, I think, I mean, it's not, it's not out of the box or unconventional, unconventional, but, um, getting the product out there, especially if you're an online retailer, um, is really, really good. Um, so, and by getting it out there, I mean, so people can actually feel it, touch it, see what it looks like on them, um, and it's not unconventional at all, and it's quite hard to do, but doing pop-ups, doing trade shows, getting stockists, um, I think it can completely transform the way the press see your brand. Um, we've got uh, one of our brands in John Lewis um, in the UK, so it's I think, 36 department stores in the UK, and it, it did completely kind of change what the press thought like they got to try it on they got to see it and we got them emailing us saying i saw you i saw the brand uh john lewis this weekend uh my call and images so i think that's really good and kind of getting it in front of them so another thing i really like that lots of our clients do is they wear their products all the time <laughs> um and it sounds really obvious but people ask them where did you get that from people on the tube ask them or if they're going to an event 
Um, I definitely think they should be wearing the product. Um, and going to kind of events where editors are speaking is also quite good and wearing the product there because, I don't know, they might just pick you out of the crowd and say, we want to feature that. Um, so not unconventional, but um, definitely useful. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely something that is pretty obvious, but I hadn't thought of it um, off the top of my head. When you said it, I thought, that's a great point. And so on that point, if you did just land a big new account and you got your product into some big name store or whatever that may be, or if you're having a pop-up shop, is it appropriate to email the right press and let them know about that? If, well, the so the key there was the right press. Um, so if they, yeah, if they don't ever, and this is when the press get annoyed, and this is why they don't respond. So if they don't ever write about um, kind of pop-up shops or events, then it's probably pointless kind of contact them, contacting them about the pop-up. Unless you are doing an event and you want to invite them down, be aware they get invited to so many events every single night. So they probably, if they haven't heard of you before, they probably won't come. Um, we actually don't do events because we're so terrified of inviting the press because <laughs> we know they'll never come. Um, and they get invited to so much that they're, they're just, I've got a few friends that work for magazines and they're just like, oh, I just, I just want a night off. I don't want to go to that opening and I don't want to go to that event. Um, so, maybe a good way to do it and we've been doing this actually with um one of our clients at the moment is uh they're an underwear brand and we they make um underwear for kind of all five size of bust um so small medium and large so kind of you and your best friends can both shop in the same place and they're really really cool and they've opened a shop in central london and we've been wanting to get the press to try their bras for ages so what we've been doing is inviting at specific editors down for fittings um so they can have a fitting of kind of a bra and then they can choose a set of their choice to take away um and that's a really nice way to get them to the shop they get something out of it not just the product but also a well-fitted bra um and they're engaged so that kind of they're engaged with the the two girls that run the brand and they get to ask them about how they started and see the shop and it looks visually beautiful so Lots of um, editors have shared it on their Instagram and a few have come back and said they might run features. Um, so I think if you can get them engaged kind of with a product, I think that's a really good way to get them down. And just be aware of kind of how far away your pop-up or your event is from their offices. Like we're really, really lucky that it's really close to all the offices. So them getting there is not an issue. But if it's kind of the other side of town, it might be more difficult for them to get there. Um, but yeah, I'd say get them engaged. Get them engaged with what you're offering. Okay, and it's okay to sort of bribe them with a free personal product? Yeah, I mean, definitely, because, again, we're, we're in this day and age of everything digital, and how would you ever know how something feels without testing it? Um, and if they don't want it, then they they just won't they just won't respond or they won't come down. So I think it's absolutely fine to say we'd like to kind of like you to try the product. I mean, we know when we give editors products, it's not because we want them to feature the brand because that's normally what, what doesn't happen. <laughs> it's because we want them to kind of get a feel for the brand. And it might be kind of they love statement earrings. We work with a statement earring brand, so we know they'd really like the product. So that's why we're giving it to them because we know they'd like it, not because we're kind of bribing them to feature to feature the brand. Okay, so again, looking for a good match between what you have to offer and what that editor likes. Yeah, yeah. I like we've had one editor that has featured one brand that we work with maybe six times in the past. Well, it's been every single issue, every single monthly issue for probably six months. Um, and so we contacted her when they released a new released a new collection and we said, just as a thank you, like, would you like a pair? Let us know which pair you'd like and we'd send them over to you. Um, and then she called them in for the next kind of two or three issues. So I, like, keep, keeping them, like, uh, not rewarding loyalty, that's not the right thing, but being grateful and showing that actually we're really grateful for your support for the brand. Would you like something before anyone else? Um, I think it's probably quite a nice gesture. Um, so, yeah, being human about it. 
Okay, and so you mentioned earlier when one of your brands got into 36 of those big department stores, you want to share that with the press, but you don't necessarily need to email them that and say, hey, my product just landed um, to show that social proof or validation, but instead to post that on your social media and website and we just kind of cross our fingers and hope that they see that and hope that they think we should pay a little more attention to this brand. Yeah. And, it, you know, the funny thing was the press knew about them before and it wasn't that they weren't taking them seriously. It was that they actually got to go and, like, see the product in real life and feel how great it is and see how well made it was and actually see what it looked like on them. That was just a massive kind of game changer um for this brand so because they knew they were a great brand before this but they'd never actually seen the physical product in real life and i think for us that was that was just it was great and um in terms of kind of the brand promoting it they obviously there are stockists on the website now um and it is on their social media not too much but it's kind of drawn in the press that maybe hadn't called knew about the brand liked the brand but hadn't called something in because they hadn't actually seen the physical product and then they saw the physical product and they were like, wow, this is great. Um, so, yeah, it was, that was great. So then would it be, and I think I have the answer in my head, but I'm just going to ask it. But if you think the product that once you could get it in their hands physically, that could wow them and flip the switch, is it inappropriate or appropriate to blindly send them a physical product to their office? Or maybe you send them an email and give them a heads up, but just say, hey, I'm going to ship this to your office. Is that rude or appropriate? Yeah, I think you know what? everyone has a different opinion on this. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think if you really think they'd like the product, if it's kind of a nice kind of gesture and you don't expect anything back on it, then... I think it's absolutely fine to send them something. I mean, um, there's a brand that I love that do door wedges. They're like hand-painted door wedges. And I said to them, you should um, send these when the press move house. So, for, like, I don't know, keep an eye on the press. And then when you see when you see an editor move house, send her a door wedge and, or him a door wedge and say, I just noticed you moved house. Here's a little, here's a little gesture for, like, your new home. Hope you like it. Oh, I think if you okay. Can kind of, so, appropriate timing. It was appropriate timing. Um, so like just before Fashion Week, we might do kind of a, a, a few ones for gifts kind of for editors that we know are going for Fashion Week. And we might say, look, we, we think you'd really like these earrings. Um, sometimes we'll email them first and say, would you like to choose a pair? Sometimes we'll just blind send them. We sent a pair, quite a big editor of Vogue, and she actually hand wrote a letter back and said, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I think... I think it's got to be appropriate um, it's got to be thought out. It shouldn't just be blind firing product that they don't want to their office. But I think if kind of you've really got to know them on social media and you know that it would be a game changer to get it in their hands and that they'd really, really like it, then I think go for it. And I really like what you said about the thoughtfulness of the timing, like with the door wedge, or you can think about what they have coming up. Yeah. Like you said, maybe it's Fashion Week. Maybe it's something that's going to make their hectic week at Fashion Week a little more enjoyable. Exactly. 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 Or they might be going on holiday. And uh, we worked with a beautiful, like, Hamam Tal brand. And kind of we kept on top of when editors were going on holiday or away. And it's really small. It fits into their suitcase, but it's beautiful. And we just would say, oh, we know you, we've seen you going on holiday in a few weeks. Um, like we'd love to send you this to take with you. So yeah, just thoughtful, thoughtful gifts. Great, great advice. Um, Rosie, this has been so much fun to chat with you and yeah. so many great tips and advice on how to get press coverage. Um, my last question is something I ask everybody at the end of the interview, and that is, what is one thing people don't ask you about working in the fashion industry that you wish they did? <laughs> um, what is one one thing that people don't ask me? Um, um, oh, um, do you get paid well? <laughs> oh, and you wish they did ask you that? Yeah, because I'd be completely honest. <laughs> I mean, 
it's a great industry and I love it. Um, obviously, I run my own business and it pays. There's no pay for me at the moment, but um, I think it's probably quite a low paying industry. Um, I'd love to kind of change that. Um, but I think it, yeah, it, there's been a stigma about people that work in it for a long time. And actually, um, it's not just kind of kind of people with money that now work in this industry. It's everyone. So I think if you can survive the pay initially, it will pay off. That's one thing that kind of people never, never ask me. I think they assume that fashion people get paid quite well and actually it's quite low at the start. So, um, yeah, if you, can, if you love it and you can stick it out, you can make it work. When I first started, I worked five or six other jobs just to kind of float my head in this industry so I kind of know it's possible um so just keep keep at it and you get there oh I love your honesty and bringing up a topic that nobody ever really talks about but it's one of those things yeah that you have to be kind of honest about if this is one of those industries that you really want to go into yeah definitely definitely all right, fantastic, Rosie. And where can everybody find you online? Um, so you can find us at www.prdispatch.com um, if you want to have a look at our PR subscriptions, or you can find us at the London Fashion Agency.com. Uh, and it's at LDN Fashion AGCY and at PR Dispatch. Awesome. And I will link to all of that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Rosie. This was really, really fun and so great to chat with you. I really appreciate your time. Cool. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thanks so much for listening to episode 30 of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. If you'd like to learn more about any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit the show notes at sfdnetwork.com slash 30. And since you made it this far, you must have liked the episode. I'll remind you that the best way you can say thanks and help spread the word about the show is to share it with other people in the industry that you know. I would be thrilled if you would take 30 seconds and shoot three friends, coworkers, professors, anybody that you know in the industry, just shoot them a quick email or text and let them know, hey, check out the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. I've really been enjoying listening to it and I think you would too. Your support and help will really help us grow and turn this into something everybody in the world can hear. All right. Thanks so much, you guys. Appreciate your support and I'll talk to you next week.